An onboard computer reveals a tragic truth. A note raises more questions than it answers, and a pet is sent on in hopes of an afterlife reunion. What other clues have been left behind at famous country death scenes? When Patsy Cline was killed in a plane crash on March 5, 1963, she had only been singing for a surprisingly short time. The crash took the life of the 30-year-old Cline, along with fellow country music stars Hawkshaw Hawkins and Cowboy Copas, and Cline's manager, Randy Hughes, who was also the plane's pilot. The cause of the crash was officially ruled as having been due to pilot inexperience and bad weather, and it was bad weather that Klein had been aware of. The oft-told tale is that even as she waved aside concerns over her flight from Kansas City back home to Nashville, she reportedly told Dottie West, Don't worry about me, Haas. When it's my time to go, it's my time to go. In 1996, a show called Friends and Company did a retrospective on the crash site and interviewed one of the first people on the scene. Jerry Pfeiffer shared that the entire crash site was strewn with their gear, from clothes to guitars, amplifiers, and equipment. It was a very uh, dreadful scene and something I'd never experienced before and hope never see again. Some of the items recovered from the crash site have been included in exhibits about her life, including a lighter in the shape of a Confederate flag and a watch given to her by her husband. Hughes's journal was also recovered from the site, documenting the last of the singer's tour dates. John Denver was killed on October 12, 1997, when the plane he was flying crashed not far off the coast of California. It took more than a year for the National Transportation Safety Board to finalize its report on what had happened. Interestingly, there were several significant things that weren't recovered at the scene, including the logbook and the autopilot. The plane was, however, recovered piecemeal, but mostly complete, and initially, two things seemed to point to a possible cause of the crash. The windscreen was shattered into pieces, and there were a lot of duck feathers found. Given that the seat cushions were labeled as being filled with goose feathers, not duck, that led to the initial theory that bird impacts had caused the crash. After consulting with experts from the Museum of Natural History, it was found that the label wasn't entirely right, and the cushions included duck feathers too. That possibility eliminated, it was later ruled that the inconvenient location of the handle that toggled between fuel tanks behind the pilot was ultimately responsible, and that Denver had lost control while trying to move the handle. When Hank Williams Sr. died at the incredibly young age of just 29 years old, 20,000 people attended his funeral. What happened in the hours around his death, just as 1952 became 1953, is part history, part myth. Williams had been on his way to Canton, Ohio, when he died in the back of his Cadillac, which was being driven by a college student he'd hired to get him to his concert after bad weather made flying impossible. That college student turned driver was Charles Carr, and in 2002, he sat down with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution to talk about that fateful night. Carr recalled helping Williams, dressed in white boots and a hat with a blue coat, load his gear into the Cadillac and picking up a six-pack of Falstaff beer. Although they had intended to stop for the night, the concert promoter told them that they needed to keep going to make it on time, so they did. Carr was in West Virginia when, troubled by the eerie silence, he pulled over and went back to check on Williams. The blanket he'd been covered with had slipped off, and Carr knew he had to find a hospital. When his body was removed from the car later, some full cans were still there, along with a few empty ones. Also in the car were notes Williams had written, with unfinished song lyrics. Carr recalled the last words William said, to anyone who heard anything at least, I just want to get some sleep. There are a few different stories about what happened on the night Tammy Wynette died, and they're recounted in Jimmy McDonough's biography, Tammy Wynette, Tragic Country Queen. What is known is that Wynette died at home on a sofa on April 6, 1998. According to the testimony her then-husband George Ritchie gave to the press, he and Wynette had been napping on the sofa in the kitchen when his daughter called at 6.55 p.m. He then saw a note taped to the kitchen table that the housekeeper had left at 6.05 p.m., saying she was running to the store. When Richie returned to the sofa, he discovered Wynette had died. Richie, however, had previously told police that both he and the housekeeper had found her body, raising questions about the housekeeper's note. Richie called Wynette's personal physician, Wallace Marsh, in Pittsburgh. In the time it took for the doctor to reach Nashville, Wynette remained on the sofa. Friends, family, and Wynette's daughters came in and out of the home, and according to Ritchie, an unnamed acquaintance removed all of Wynette's medical records, prescriptions, and paraphernalia from the scene. But what happened to them remains unclear. Marsh certified that Wynette's cause of death was a blood clot in her lungs, but her daughters were unconvinced. They filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Marsh and Ritchie. Wynette's body was exhumed and an autopsy was performed. It was ruled that the cause of death had actually been heart failure, caused most likely by blood clots that had previously collected in her lungs. Naomi Judd died by suicide on the day before she and her daughter, Winona Judd, were due to be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. 
Her death started a very important conversation about how much the public is entitled to know and how much privacy should be respected. Not two weeks had passed since Judd's April 30th, 2022 death when her daughter Ashley Judd sat down with Diane Sawyer. Ashley said that she had been put forward as the family's spokesperson as they knew that information was going to be made public and they wanted to speak before that happened. When we're talking about mental illness, it's very important and, and to be clear and to make the distinction between our loved one and the disease. By August, the family was involved in a highly publicized court case in an attempt to keep the details of Naomi's death private. Although they were initially granted a temporary verdict, confirming that things like official investigation reports and photos were not to be released, they ultimately were. Outlets including the New York Post and Radar Online ultimately ran photos of Naomi's bed, showing the hurriedly written post-it note she also left behind. Since then, Ashley has spearheaded a movement to prioritize sensitive reporting and allow families to keep images, recordings, and evidence private. She told The Guardian, The dark past in God's hands becomes our greatest asset. With it, we can avert misery and death for others. Ricky Nelson was the son of stars Ozzy and Harriet Nelson, and a massive genre-crossing star in his own right. He, his fiancée, and other band members were killed in a plane crash on January 1st, 1986, and just what happened was, from the beginning, sketchy and misreported. Initial reports confirmed his death without getting into too much detail, saying that whatever had happened on the flight, it had caused a fire to burn so hot that rescue workers had to wait to recover remains. It didn't take long for the headlines to start the chatter. Nelson's manager, Greg McDonald, and brother David Nelson both issued statements saying that early reports claiming the fire had broken out because the plane's passengers were freebasing cocaine were completely untrue. The reports ran in multiple reputable media outlets, while officials replied that nothing had actually been determined at the time the news hit. At that early stage, they did confirm that while aerosol cans had been found at the site, they had been in the baggage compartment, discounting the drug theory. It was later reported that the likely cause of the blaze, crash, and deaths was a faulty heater on board the plane. And perhaps strangest of all was the fact that when the investigation was finished, some of the wreckage, including the tail of the plane, was left behind at the crash site. It was eventually installed at the Williams House Museum in DeKalb, Texas. When Justin Towns Earl's death was announced in 2020, there was no cause of death officially released, but it wasn't long before the New York Times reported that the autopsy findings had led to a determination that he had died of an accidental drug overdose. The toxicology report found that he had cocaine and fentanyl in his system, and it was in line with information Fox News had obtained from the Metro Nashville Police Department's Don Aaron. While Aaron didn't reveal exactly what first responders had found, he did say, The preliminary investigation, which takes into account observations at the scene, indicates that death is likely related to a drug overdose. Earl's father, outlaw country star Steve Earl, later recorded and released an album of his son's songs, and those recordings started even before the official cause of death had been issued. He called the album cathartic and noted that he had been all too familiar with his son's addictions. He recalled their last phone call. I said, do not make me bury you. And he said, I won't. No trouble figuring out what the worst year of my life is, and that's saying something. On September 4th, 2019, Sheriffs and first responders from Taos County, New Mexico, responded to an accident scene involving three cars. Two women were dead, and in a pre-investigation statement to Taos News, Sheriff Jerry Hogreff didn't pull any punches. At this time, I will say with most certainty that Miss Cruz was an innocent victim of this senseless crash caused by Miss Harris. Miss Cruz was 16-year-old Maria Elena Cruz, who had been driving home from work when the crash occurred. Harris was on her way to a music festival when she clipped the car in front of her and crossed into the opposite lane, hitting Cruz in a head-on collision. Making the story even more tragic is the fact that Cruz's father, a deputy fire chief, had been driving along the same stretch of road when he came upon the accident. Very traumatic for him to uh, not know, but to respond anyway, and then find that it was his family member. Details of exactly what happened came from two places, Harris's autopsy and the onboard computer recovered from her car at the scene. While the autopsy revealed that she had been driving with a blood alcohol content of more than three times the legal limit, the computer revealed details just as telling. Harris's speed at the time of the impact with the first car was recorded at 102 miles per hour, and at the time she hit Cruz's car, she was clocked at 95 miles per hour. I have never in my entire life had up until a certain point, never had had a suicidal thought. After country music star Mindy McCready died by suicide in 2013, news outlets across the country recounted her tumultuous recent history, including her fight for custody of her son, arrest for drunk driving, her high-profile involvement in the 2010 season of Celebrity Rehab with Dr. Drew, and the death of her boyfriend, producer David Wilson. 
Her death came one month after Wilson also died by suicide, and according to reports, they were both discovered on the front porch of their home. Also found at the scene of her death was the body of the dog she shared with Wilson, and reports said that the dog had been shot and killed prior to her death. A friend of McCready's, Dan O'Hanks, spoke with E! News to explain that he didn't believe she had killed the dog out of despair, but love. Her discussions about leaving her life wasn't that she wanted to end her life, but she wanted to join David, and David loved that dog, and so she'd be taking the dog with her. Hanks also added that McCready had reached out to him the day prior to her death, and he said that it was an important lesson that everyone could take away with them. I wish I had been more alert to what it was. Everybody wants to reach out after the fact, but nobody wants to be there when it is happening. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please dial or text 988 to speak with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You can also seek help by visiting 988lifeline.org.